All right, I think we will get started. Thank you for being here. Good morning. Um, were any of you here for the opening CLE session? Yes, good, good. So um, I'm very uh, happy to be here. This is a session where we're going to be talking about animal testing, both here in the United States and internationally. And I would like to start out by introducing both of our distinguished panelists. To my immediate right is David Casuto. He's a professor of law at Pace Law School, where he teaches in the field of animal law, environmental law, and property. He serves on the board of ALDF and is also the class of 1946 Distinguished Visiting Professor of Environmental Law at Williams College. And he's a visiting professor of law at the Federal University of Bahia, Brazil. He does speak Portuguese. He holds a JD from the University of California, Berkeley, a PhD from Indiana University, and a BA from Wesleyan University. Prior to joining the Pace faculty, he practiced complex civil litigation, clerked with the US Court of Appeals for the 11th Circuit, and was a professor of American literature. He speaks and writes frequently on animal law and policy, as well as many other topics within environmental law and environmental and cultural studies. And in addition to several books and many articles on topics ranging from water as a cultural signifier to climate change in factory farms, Professor Casuto is also the founder and principal contributor to the Animal Blog, and that's B-L-A-W-G, a blog on animal law ethics and policy, and I encourage all of you to check that out and read what he has to say. Next to David is Paul Locke. He's a, an associate professor at the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. He's an environmental health scientist and attorney, which is very handy because he can speak both languages. Um, and as I mentioned, he's an associate professor at the Johns Hopkins University Bloomberg School of Public Health in the Department of Environmental Health Sciences Division of Toxicology. He holds a master's in public health from Yale University School of Medicine, a doctorate in public health from the Johns Hopkins University Bloomberg School of Public Health, and a JD degree from Vanderbilt University School of Law. His research and practice focus on how decision makers use environmental health science and toxicology in regulation and policy making and how environmental health sciences influence the policy making process. His areas of study include ra radiation policy as well as the law of humane science and policy with an emphasis on how in vitro and non-mammalian toxicology data can be incorporated into regulatory decision making under US laws. He directs the school's Doctor of Public Health program in Environmental Health Sciences and is a faculty member of the Center for Alternatives to Animal Testing and the Center for Law and the Public's Health. He's published papers in peer-reviewed journals and law reviews, including, including the Columbia Journal of Environmental Law, the Environmental Law Reporter, Health Physics, and the Journal of Toxicology and Environmental Health. He served on six National Academy of Sciences study committees, including the committee that recently updated the guide for the care and use of laboratory animals. He's also been a distinguished visiting uh, professor at Lewis and Clark Law School, where he has taught the first ever Law of Humane Science class, which was very exciting. So without further ado, please welcome our panelists. And what we like to do is we, I would like uh, Dr. Locke to um, give us a primer on the three R's and animal testing generally and, and how we've gotten to this point in time in animal testing. So please. Well, thank you very much. And uh, I want to thank everyone for coming um, so early, well, early for me, on uh, Sunday morning. <laughs> I'm saved somewhat because I'm an East Coaster, so it's actually three hours ahead. But those of you on the West Coast, this was a sacrifice. Um, I'm going to, we have an hour together. and. Um, in our conversations about this panel, we really wanted to make sure we had good audience interaction. So I'm going to try to spend 10 to 15 minutes going over this topic very quickly, which means that I'm going to have to leave out a lot of important things, which also means that our expectation is that you guys will catch us and ask us hard questions about those. So um, forgive me first for not being as complete as I can um, in the um, tradition of shameless advertisement. I will try to entice you and recruit you to take uh, the course this summer, the Law of Humane Sciences, that we'll, we'll be offering at Lewis and Clark Law School to learn more. And um, that course includes some lab tours as well. It's quite exciting. We, we put you right in there with the scientists. But we're going to go through probably today about 300 years of history and tradition very quickly. 
So let me just um, start out by um, talking about the history of animals and research. Now, the history of animals and research has a long tradition, and really it, it did date back uh, as early as the 17th century, but it really got going in the 19th century when scientists um, discovered this germ theory of disease. And that is the idea that uh, infectious diseases actually spread through microbes. Before that, there were a whole bunch of theories of disease ranging anything from phlogiston. You know, there was this phlogiston that floated around and infected you to miasma. But it was really Koch and Pasteur, Pasteur that really got into the germ theory of disease. And they actually used quite a few animals, especially Pasteur, in research. Those early experiments were crude and painful for animals. Um, animals were also used in surgery to develop new techniques. And there was an, an unfortunate tradition of vivisection to demonstrate uh, anatomy. So uh, the 18th and 19th centuries, not a good situation. And there really did evolve a, a, a very vigorous discussion about animals and research, especially in the United Kingdom. Just to sort of set the benchmark, um, I, I sort of picked out two uh, philosophers from that time period uh, to demonstrate to you what people were thinking about. Descartes um, is, uh, you know, more representative of the, what I would call the property-based philosophy. Animals are property, and um, we can use them as we see fit in research. Uh, Jeremy Bentham, more the utilitarian tradition. Um, we have to focus on the animals. It's not whether they can talk or think, but it's whether they can suffer. And indeed, um, as we look forward, it's really Bentham who kind of won the day, because very much of our animal laws and animal policies using animals and research are focused on eliminating and minima minimizing pain and distress and suffering. Um, so uh, why do we use animals? Um, there are many reasons why we use animals. First of all, um, animals and humans get the same diseases. It's considered um, unethical to experiment directly on humans, although we do experiment on humans. We, we normally do some work on animals and in, in the lab and in vitro systems before we do that. Um, animals and humans do have similar organ, structure, uh, organ structures, and many um, physiological and biological processes are highly conserved across species. What that means is that you can use C. elegans worms to study developmental neurotoxicology because the neuron structure has enough similarity for us to really make good scientific conclusions. Also, um, research using animals often benefited the animals in protecting animals from death, disease, and disfigurement. I'm going to skip through um, this uh, case study, um, and I want to talk a little bit about the evolution of the three R's. So as um, we continue to use animals in research, it became apparent pretty rapidly, at least by the, the middle of the last century, that we had to have some structure to make sure that we were really using animals in an appropriate way, and when the situation called for it, not using animals. And that really developed uh, around this concept of the three R's. The three R's are replacement, reduction, and refinement. These are very important because today, I would argue that they really structure all societal approaches to animal research, all laws, all policies. Um, and um, we'll talk a little bit about in the panel how they've been incorporated into laws in the US and in the EU. Now, these are the two gentlemen that got us rolling on the three R's. These are uh, Russell and Birch. I don't remember which is which, so please don't ask me about that. But. Um, these are uh, two British scientists who were asked by basically the government in the UK to come up with um, a treatise on how we should use animals in research. And they came up with this idea of humane experimental techniques. And the key philosophy here, and this is extremely important, so if you don't remember anything else from what I say, please remember this. The key philosophy is that you cannot do good scientific research unless the animals are humanely treated. Animals that are suffering, animals that are not humanely treated, do not yield good scientific research. So from a scientific perspective, it's extremely important to treat the animals humanely. I'm putting aside the ethical arguments, not because they're not important. They're extremely important because our session is focusing on animals and research, and I want to focus a little on the science. So in addition to all the strong ethical reasons, there's a very strong scientific reason for making sure that animals are well treated in research. 
And that came clear in, in Russell and Birch's um, book, which was published in 1959. Um, it's, it's actually out of print, but you can get a paper copy, I believe, from the Animal Welfare Institute in the United States. And um, my um, organization, uh, Center for Alternatives to Animal Testing, has the complete guide online uh, if you want to go to our website and get it. Um, this really has been adopted through the ages and, again, is the basis for our laws, regulations, and policies. And as um, Dean uh, Frasch mentioned, I sat on a National Academy committee uh, which revised this guide for the care and use of laboratory animals. And that really is our latest version of how to incorporate the three R's into research practice. Um, first thing you should know is that um, in terms of the way responsibility is set out, the guide and um, most of the US traditions put the emphasis clearly on the institution. Every institution has to establish an animal care and use program. Um, it has to have um, an IACUC, an institutional care and use committee which must be established to oversee and evaluate the program. The IACUC basically has two major responsibilities. It does inspections of all the labs, all the housing facilities, and it also reviews all protocols. Now, uh, under, um, under US law, um, under the Animal Welfare Act under US law, rats, mice, and birds are not considered to be animals, which is a little unusual, I will say. And um, not, uh, that is an area of criticism that many um, lawyers and many animal activists have pointed out. Under the Public Health Services Act, which covers all research that is funded by the US government, however, rats, mice, and birds are covered. Um, and because we don't keep track of numbers in the United States, I can't tell you how many rats, mice, and birds are used, or how many are covered, or how many are not covered. But every institution has to have an IACUC to review all protocols. And my, my feeling is that institutions will review protocols with rats, mice, and birds, whether or not they're under the Animal Welfare Act or they're under the Public Health Services Act, because very often it's just the really reaching the best scientific goals that is important. And that's what one of these IACUCs is supposed to do. That's one of the goals they're supposed to fulfill. Every program has to be under the uh, control of either a veterinarian or another qualified professional who has equivalent training. And at least one vet has to be associated with the program. <laughs> The institution must um, appoint an institutional official. They're responsible for maintaining records and conducting an occupational safety and health program for their workers. Now, um, the guide establishes the minimum ethical practice and care standards. Organizations and institutions can go beyond these, and many do. However, the system is not a transparent system, so there's nowhere you can go on the internet or there's not really much you can do to check to see how individual institutions are doing unless um, there, are, there are certain sections to that. But generally, this is institution specific and the institutions self-regulate. Okay, so what are the three R's? Apologies for this very detailed slide, um, but um, I, I, I used my kind of um, lawyer hat here to cram as much as I could in small print on this slide. <laughs> Um, there, the three R's are replacement, refinement, and reduction, as I mentioned. And I'm going to start with replacement. Replacement refers to methods that avoid using animals. So instead of using a rodent, you might use some sort of in vitro system, a cell system, maybe a computational toxicology system. There's also something called relative replacement, where you replace um, animals that are, uh, such as vertebrates, with animals that are lower on the phylogenetic scale. So you might, instead of using a vertebrate, you might use a zebrafish, something like that. Um, ref I work mostly in the replacement area, by the way. Um, other of my colleagues work on the other two R's. Refinement are modifications of husbandry or experimental procedures that enhance the animal well-being and minimize or eliminate pain and distress. Again, that Benthamite tradition carried forward. This is very important, and it is critical to both science and ethics in the laboratory. And um, in our modern US system and also in the, EU, in the EU system, a lot of time is spent on making sure that we get replacement right. Reduction involves strategies for obtaining comparable levels of information from use of fewer animals or maximizing the information obtained from a given number of animals. So you use fewer animals, get the same scientific information. 
And this approach relies on making sure your experimental design is correct, that you're not using too few animals and you're not using too many animals, that you are using newer techniques, and that um, your statistical methods are actually going to give you the scientific information that you think you can get. Um, just um, one set of last slides uh, about the Animal Welfare Act. In the United States, the Animal Welfare Act actually arose, started in a very interesting way. So um, I know just looking around that many of you probably weren't um, uh, here when this uh, magazine was published, but this is 1966, and this is a Life magazine. I always put the cover up because if you go to a tag sale, it might be something you want to pick up to actually see the article. So you can see on the cover Sammy Davis Jr., Harry Belafonte, and um, Sidney Poitier, and there was a, an article in this called Concentration Camp for Dogs. It was a very, very striking article about how poorly dogs were treated in um, facilities that were preparing the dogs for research. And this led to the passage of the first Animal Welfare Act that regulated these dealers. Um, by the way, there was another um, magazine article that came out the year before this in 1965 talking about animals and research that was also very, very important. Anybody know what journal that was published in? No? Pam? Sports Illustrated. Sports Illustrated. <laughs> so, you know, imagine that. Life Magazine and Sports <laughs> Illustrated really pushing forward in this, in this field. Um, this led to the passage of the Animal Welfare Act, which required uh, regulation of dealers, and it required the humane treatment, and um, uh, it required IACUCs. And it is broadly applicable. I won't go through many of its features. Um, I did talk about the, the carve out in the Animal Welfare Act that it doesn't cover rats, mice, and birds. But um, the Animal Welfare Act is on the books, and it, does, it is based on the Commerce Clause, so it covers any animals in, re in research that are used in the United States, but not rats, mice, and birds. Um, I just want to finish up by um, talking about the Public Health Service Act a little bit, because for me, uh, at an academic institution, and if you're working with academic institutions, this is probably going to be the law that covers them. Now, the way this law is written, it requires the Secretary of uh, Health and Human Services to establish guidelines for um, proper care and treatment, requirements to establish IACUCs, to review and keep records, and to report violations to NIH. Um, the IACUC requirements in this law are slightly different than the Animal Welfare Act, but not so different that they can't be harmonized in a facility that is getting both NIH and non-NIH research. And um, the key here is that this law requires the establishment of guidelines. So those guidelines actually are what are captured in the Guide for the Care and Use of Laboratory Animals, the one I showed earlier, I and I mentioned I was on that committee. We revised that guide in 2011. Uh, the Public Health Service has a policy on humane care and use of laboratory animals. They take this policy very seriously. And um, they work very hard to make sure that their research facilities are complying with the policy. Again, this system is mainly a system of self-regulations. Institutions are in charge of policing themselves. It's not a transparent system. And this is something that we can talk more about. It's hard to really get a sense of um, what's going on in the facilities. If there are violations, you, you can get that information. But on a day-to-day -day level, it's, it's, not a, it's a, a no-paid system. So let me finish by just saying that it, one of the ways I like to think about this is that there are sort of four key parties to the use of animals in research. There are, of course, the animals themselves. There's the researcher, and the researchers and the principal investigators play an extremely important role in implementing humane care and guidance and choosing alternatives when they're available. There's the institution itself, which has the legal responsibility for the program. And then there's, of course, society and societal needs. And these all drive each other and fit together. Um, it's a patchwork system, and I'm, as I mentioned, um, it, it's a system that's been oft criticized, but it is a system that researchers try to implement with good faith, and most of the researchers that I've worked with are extremely concerned about the animals under their care and the animals that they're using. And they understand that these animals sacrifice their lives to make our lives better and to make the lives of other animals better. So I think I'll stop there. Okay.
Um, and I know, yes. I, we, we really do want to get to questions right away, but uh, this panel is also, thank you so much for giving that primer on what's happened, how we got here in the United States. But the panel is also focusing on what is happening internationally in animal testing. So perhaps before we get to q and I'll ask both of our panelists to give um, maybe just a, a, a brief couple of comments about what is happening in the EU. Perhaps, Paul, you can talk about that. And in Brazil, David, perhaps you can talk about that. And David, would you like to start? Sure. I'll, although before I start, I, 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 want to, uh, I want to amend something I said yesterday for those of you who are at, at the uh, the CAFO panel, I announced that, that the Lewis and, Lewis and Clark was the only animal law clinic in the country, and I have been corrected on that, and I actually knew that this was so. South Texas College of Law has an animal law clinic, and I was rightly reprimanded for not mentioning that yesterday. So, <laughs> so please uh, do understand that, that it, they do wonderful work down there, and you should check them out. Okay, so <laughs> with, 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 respect to, uh, with respect to what's going on in Brazil, Brazil is an interesting case um, because there is a, a really, the, the, constitu the Brazilian constitution speaks directly to the treatment of animals. It's, it, it explicitly bars the uh, cruelty, cruelty to animals. So that makes for interesting law and legal uh, tangles, which I'll get to in just a second, but let me just back up and, 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 and give a, a, a one-minute uh, summary of the, of the history. In 1934, Brazil passed an animal protection law, which essentially was an anti-cruelty law, but didn't directly address vivisection. In 1941, Brazil passed the Criminal Misdemeanor Act, which, again, was directed, aimed, aimed at animal cruelty, but did mention also uh, research animals explicitly and said that alternatives should be sought. And then in 1979, Brazil passed the uh, Vivisection Act, which explicitly legalized vivisection, but also mandated that it be regulated. Um, but those regulations were never actually promulgated. Uh, in 1988, we have the Brazilian Constitution. The Brazilian Constitution is quite young, as you can uh, as you can see, um, <coughs> which was when Brazil emerged from military dictatorship. And as Section two two five of the Brazilian Constitution, in addition to guaranteeing all humans the right to a healthy environment, which is another interesting and important clause in the Constitution, also speaks directly to cruelty against animals. Um, 1998, we have the passage of the Environmental Crimes Act, which outlaws cruelty to all animals, wild, domestic, or domesticated. And many scholars in Brazil believe that that also explicitly outlawed vivisection. However, in 2008, we have the passage of the Laboratory Animals Act, which legalizes vivisection. But also creates the Brazilian equivalent of IACUCs or institutional, uh, is it the same as an institutional review board, and um, also regulates it. But many in Brazil, scholars as well as activists, think that this 2008 law is unconstitutional because there is this clause in the Constitution that says that you can't be cruel to animals. And it's, it is hard to really, I think, uh, I mean, one has to one has to do some some juggling, semantic juggling, to say that experimenting on an animal, which will lead to its to a, a painful death, is not cruel. And but obviously, br there are all kinds of contradictions within the laws of any country. Brazil eats a lot of meat. You know, there's there's not it's not it's not a clear cut issue. However, it is it is an issue that is ripe for debate. And in fact, just I'm going to say ten days ago. There was an incident in Brazil, which I think is unprecedented in the country, where a group of activists broke into a laboratory and freed about 200 beagles. And they, they, uh, they put up a video on YouTube, which we can show a little of if you folks want to. Um, and there, it, the thing about it that's interesting also is that it was a spontaneous act. They were just demonstrating. And then at 2 in the morning, they got so riled up, they said, let's go in there and get the, be the beagles. And they did. And now 
there's all kinds of, uh, of debate in Brazil about what to do with the beagles, what to do with the activists. They're, the activists are saying, hey, it was illegal to have the, the la for the laboratory to have them. And the laboratory is saying, hey, it was illegal for you to take them. And so there are cases right now pending before this Brazilian Supreme Court regarding the constitutionality of the 2008 law. And the Brazilian Public Prosecutor's Office, which is essentially a fourth arm of the government that is charged with, among other things, making sure that the government doesn't break its own laws, is uh, it, it's a little uncertain how what what position it's going to take on this. So, so this is really cutting edge stuff right now in Brazil. Just going to show a, a couple of you know 20, 30 seconds of it. You can see these folks milling around the laboratory. <laughs> this is a cell phone video. Um, Gente, the é tudo verdade. Olha isso aqui, ó. Tudo, tudo verdade. É uma vida. Olha, é uma vida. Ela já tá cheia, gente. Alguém desce lá e pega. Olha isso aqui. Olha isso aqui. Conseguimos. Tem mais. Tem mais. Alguém, por favor. So, so you know, their feelings run high, as you can imagine. Um, beagles, as uh, perhaps Paul is going to talk about this also, beagles are often the subject of laboratory experiments because they are one of the most docile breeds. So they are bred for laboratory use because they are, they are easier to handle. And so you know, that raises, I think, all kinds of ethical issues as well. Yeah, I think rabbits would fall into the same category. Yeah. Um, so I'll talk a little bit about the EU. Before I do that, I do want to make one um, uh, just point. Um, with the exception of a research protocol that studies pain, and those are unusual, there is no principle or law that I can think of that would allow cruel treatment of animals in a laboratory, period, end of story. Um, that is my understanding of the law and the principles that cover animals and research in both the EU countries, the member states, and the US. So I think it's really important if you hear of cases of cruelty, as far as I'm concerned, you know, I, I, I obviously have to look at the individual facts. We're all lawyers here, right? But um, that is not accepted and not acceptable. It's just not good practice. It's unethical, and it's bad science. Um, let's get to the EU. The EU has actually been quite advanced in their protection of animals. First, I'll just talk briefly about the cosmetics uh, situation. The EU uh, put into place a cosmetics regulation. And, a re and, and the way I understand uh, laws to work um, uh, in the EU system is that a regulation is not something that has to be transposed into national law. It becomes effective immediately. If somebody knows differently, please correct me, because this is not an area where I have as much expertise as I'd like. But uh, this regulation basically says there's a marketing ban on any cosmetics in the EU member states if the cosmetics were tested on animals or if any of the components of the cosmetics were tested on animals. So it's a very, very strong marketing ban. Industry, uh, the cosmetics industry obviously didn't really like it. Uh, it makes their jobs more difficult. But it, it is a very strong statement about how cosmetics will be marketed in the EU member states. For laboratory animals, there is a directive on laboratory animal protection that was, uh, I guess the best word is passed in 2010 and came into full force and effect on January 1st this year, 2013. And that has some features in it that are, are quite um, important. I just want to talk about those for a minute. First, it does establish um, national agencies and institutional um, organizations like IACUCs 
Um, it also establishes a laboratory to develop alternatives because if you're going to move away from animals in testing and research, you've got to have some way of doing the testing and research. So this is something that I've been working on a lot. You've got to establish a science that is a non-animal based in vitro toxicology science. So the, the EU law does that. Um, the EU law also requires that every protocol be summarized in a non-technical way. The system is a bit more transparent because the EU, for example, actually counts the number of animals that are used. Um, the um, system also uh, makes it almost impossible. It'll let, it erects very high barriers to using non-human primates, especially great apes. And by the way, that's also happening in the United States in a kind of different way, but not, I think, as assertively it ha as it has under the um, EU um, Animals uh, and Laboratory Directive. And um, there are some other features about the EU law um, that are different than the United States. One of the major ones is in, under the EU law, you can only use purpose-bred animals. You cannot use animals that are not purpose-bred for the laboratory. In the United States, although the National Academy of Sciences has said it's not really something we want to encourage, you can still use non-purpose-bred animals. And just before we open it up to Q&A, because we do want to do that, um, uh, I, I wanted to bring um, into play also what's happening in China, um, just so we have a true international viewpoint. Now, as you just heard what Paul said, there is a ban in the EU on uh, animal testing for uh, cosmetic products. In China, we have the exact opposite occurring. In China, uh, China requires animal testing as a condition for marketing any cosmetic product or, or uh, uh, personal care product. So you have companies that are not, so, so we, sometimes we talk about international harmonization because we have these different testing protocols that are required or not required in different countries. So you have some companies who, if they're marketing their products in the EU or the United States, they're not testing on those products. But the same company, if they're exporting to China, they are required to test. So they've got two different protocols, two different regimes going on. And in fact, the, it's a huge, as you can imagine, China, it's a, it's a huge market for companies. So their beauty and personal care market right now is uh, estimated to grow to $34.8 billion just this year. The other thing that we have uh, happening in China right now is that there are virtually no regulations. So a lot of testing is going on. It's virtually unregulated. So what does that mean? It means that for people who really want to maybe press the envelope, try some different types of protocols, they are exporting that testing to China because there is a lack of regulation. We have some data in terms of numbers of animals, but it's, it's unclear whether these, these numbers are even realistic because there is no transparency. There aren't any uh, numbers which are really coming out. But what we know from the Shanghai Institutes for Biological Sciences, they're saying that about 15 million animals are used in scientific research each year, which seems extraordinarily low to me, given how much testing is going on. We were having a conversation. What were you saying in terms of the numbers of animals that were being used? I think in the EU it's between 25 and 30 million. And they have a ban <laughs> for, <laughs> well, cosmetics. for cosmetics. Yeah. For cosmetics. Yeah. For cosmetics. So if you think about the, the market in China, the fact that there isn't a ban, in fact there's a requirement, 15 million seems, seems awfully low. Um, you also have uh, traditional Chinese medicine, which utilizes animal testing, animal models, animal parts. Um, and you have a robust non human primate breeding uh, industry in China as well. So uh, China exported over 12,000 macaques uh, just a few years ago for research. And again, this is just the most recent information that we have. It's really hard to get information, but you can imagine that perhaps those numbers are going up. So one of the reasons that we wanted to focus a little bit on China today and also Brazil is because um, those are two areas where we're seeing growing numbers of animal testing occurring. Um, and then we have the EU, where we're seeing sort of the sort of a, uh, a contraction of some of that testing, which is happening. So we have a lot of different models. Um, but what we want to do right now, we know we have a very short session, so we really wanted to open it up to questions from the audience. So we have Mike set up right here, um, and if anybody has any questions, I know it's early in the morning. Oh, good, we have somebody coming down. 
mostly as I work at ALDF. Um, I came in late, so I'm sorry if I'm repeating anything. Um, so two, two questions. So one, you said something about how unless you're studying pain, there's really no reason in the U.S. to be cruel to an animal. Speak up a little. I don't think the mic is on. Um, what do you think about uh, psychological sort of deprivation studies, so maternal deprivation, or if you have to isolate animals or, um, because they're being medically tested with a disease? Um, that seems to me to not violate any of the AWA, or you can get an exception for it. So that's one question. And the other question I had is, because this is not a transparent system in the U.S., how can you find actors who are violated? Uh, either because the iCook is agreeing to something that they shouldn't be agreeing to, or because the researcher themselves is not following their own safety protocol. Oh, those are really good questions. Um, as to your first question, which is, what about psychological deprivation studies? Um, I, first, I, I have to be clear that I am not that familiar with that field because it's a it's not part of the sort of normal biomedical research that I work in. So my my sense is, if I understand this correctly, you're talking about studies where, especially higher order animals like non-human primates, are put in a situation where you are trying to study things like depression and other things like that. Um, I guess the way I would approach that, the first question I would ask is, um, what is the scientific merit of those studies? And incidentally, in, in the class that we have um, at Lewis and Clark, we go to the primate center and we meet with primate researchers. And we, uh, the students prepare to ask them questions. And I think one of the things I would say as attorneys, if you want to represent your clients appropriately, I, I, I hate to tell you this, but you've got to jump into the science a little bit. You don't have to get a doctoral degree, okay? I mean, I did, but you don't have to do that. <laughs> but you have do to. Do you regret it? Well, um, that's another session. Uh, no, actually, I don't. Um, you have to really have enough of an understanding of the science to ask intelligent questions, which is what lawyers do anyways. So that's the first thing I would ask. Um, the second thing I would point out is that in terms of non-human primates, it's going to get harder and harder and harder to do research on non-human primates. So under the EU directive, I can't quote the exact language off the top of my head, but the barriers are erected um, that says, unless you are doing research that relates to a critical emergency condition in a human, you shouldn't be using non-human primates. So that, in terms of the first question, I can't totally answer it. I can kind of give you some clues. The second question, how can you find violators? Um, if uh, somebody violates a Public Health Services Act policy, uh, they should be, you should be able to go to the NIH website and find that. But that's kind of a top level, tip of the, you know, that's the part of the iceberg out of the water violation. As to other violations um, or warnings, much, much harder to get those. And that's where the system transparency really breaks down. Um, so, Kind of building on what you said about non-human primates, um, with the NIH announcement about chimps and research and that they want to retire 300 chimps, um, where is the law going to kind of come into this? And um, I mean, I work with chimps, so that's my big interest, and that's why I came here, because I want to know how, how we can protect apes with the law. Because the NIH might say, oh, we want to retire 300 chimps, but where is the law going to be coming in to enforce that and to enforce the retirement of chimps? Okay, so um, I think this is how it's going to work. Um, the National Academy of Sciences came out with a report that basically said, you know, we, we should, except for a couple of very, very specific instances, we should not be doing research on chimps, okay, which is consistent with the EU. The national, then uh, the NIH took that report and they said, yeah, you know, you're right, we're going to implement this. So the mechanism for kind of doing that probably is not passing a law or changing regulation. It's um, a uh, funding mechanism. You submit a protocol that has chimp research, we're not going to fund it. So I think that's probably how it's going to work. And then the NIH will focus more on um, making sure that the chimps are retired appropriately and treated appropriately in their retirement. But I don't... I don't predict I, any kind of actual regulation happening in the near future for uh, preventing apes in research. Um, I think that given what's gone on with the NIH and the, um, the statement they've made, I don't see that happening because I think that they've done enough to create a situation where it would be extremely difficult to use chimps in research and maybe even impossible. Okay. 
And, and that also brings up a, a very good point, is that a lot of this animals and research issue happens at the policy level. And, it, and, it, and it's implemented at NIH through the funding mechanism. Funding is, is always uh, a key. And that's a place I would look to. Um, you know, I know Jane Velez Mitchell told you to go out there and write lawsuits in, uh, last night. And uh, this, is not, this is not an area where that's easy to do. But this is something you might want to look to in terms of funding. You know, are research projects that are being funded appropriate? Okay. Hi, my name is Sabrina. Uh, thank you very much for your presentation. Uh, I was wondering if uh, for uh, China's situation on animal testing, if you can see uh, how international trade law can be used against their practices, perhaps on EU action within the World Trade Organization? So do you want to speak to the EU aspect of that? Yeah. Um, that's, a, that's a really wonderful question. And of course, that <laughs> That's a whole other conversation in terms of, of international trade and, and what kind of pressures are going to be brought to bear. I do know that there is in process right now a national animal welfare law which focuses on anti-cruelty provisions which has been proposed in China. The system there, of course, is radically different than the system in the United States, in the EU, and in, in Canada in terms of how laws are passed. So it's probably many years outside of, uh, you know, many years from actually being passed. But there are a group of activists which are really looking at this, and a group of academics as well. And there have been a number of, of conferences that have been held in China over the last, I would say, eight to 10 years or so, where people have been really looking at this sort of issue. In terms of whether, I mean, looking at the actual international trade aspect of it, I don't know if either of you have any insight into how that type of pressure could be brought to bear, not only with China, but, but with other countries who perhaps are, are continuing to test um, in light of the fact that the EU now has this ban for cosmetic testing. I don't, I don't have any specific insights. I, I would just note that, I mean, there are, it also depends on the nature of the particular trade agreements amongst various countries, and there are lots of them, so it becomes, it's, it's complicated on that scale. And it's also complicated in the sense that some, the enforcement mechanism for these trade agreements should, and if they apply, often take years to litigate and end up, and, and, and so, I, I'm certainly not telling you anything you probably don't know, but but these are these are these would be the the caution flags that would arise for me were I looking to enforce anything through international trade law. In some ways, I think the biggest pressure point can be that if you have these companies in China who want to be selling products to the EU and to other countries, and if they want to do that, they need to be doing things differently because the EU will not, they have the cosmetic ban, for example. So in some ways, I think just the economic pressure of those companies who are trying to have a global reach will be one of the more effective ways of trying to affect change. I don't know if you want to comment. Well, you may remember um, we had um, a series of seminars that we put together with Lewis and Clark and the University of Ottawa and, and a couple of other institutions about the implementation of um, uh, toxicity testing, in vitro toxicity testing. And we specifically asked uh, a couple of companies, OK, what are you going to do? You know, you've got a situation where in the EU you can't have a cosmetic where any of the components or the cosmetic itself has been tested on animals. But you have a place like China where it has to be. How are you going to handle that? And after some hemming and hawing, the basic answer I heard was, well, we're going to just make the same product with different formulations. So from a business perspective, it's, you know, it's not a very good thing because it's more expensive and it's, it's not the way you want to run your business. But I think that might be what happens. And, and frankly, that's something I really worry about is just kind of this race to the bottom um, where we tighten up standards that need to be tightened up. But then there are places in the world uh, that, that will be very amenable to practices that we'd like not to happen. Thank you. Hi, good morning. <coughs> I'm Lorraine Huff, and I'm the executive director of the Texas Society for Biomedical Research. And what I do is represent the research facilities in the state of Texas that conduct uh, ethical, responsible, humane biomedical research, animal research. I just had a couple of comments more than a question, and if you don't mind me reading this to you. Um, I would like to suggest that on the slide, that you amend the slide that has the four components, because it said, the slide suggests that it's the researchers that take care of the animals, 
And that is not usually the case. There, it's, I think it's really uh, extremely important that we recognize lab animal care staff. Um, they dedicate their lives to ensure the health and well-being of the animals. They are not data points to them. They are sentient beings <coughs> that are named, loved, and mourned when they, when they are die, when they die. And I would also like to suggest that you add a fourth R, which is part of our philosophy in the biomedical research community, and that is respect. We, I wholeheartedly believe that we are the gold standard of animal com care compared to um, other animal enterprises. We all hope for the day when no, animals are no longer necessary in biomedical research. We too are advocates for animals. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, I wanted to first thank you for your comments. I think they're very much on point, and um, you actually fulfilled one of the things that I asked when we started, which was that we had a short period of time to make presentations and there were gaps. And you point out a very important gap that I want to just take a minute to discuss. Um, the laboratory animal staff are key to having an excellent program. And the state associations of biomedical research work with them to make sure they're appropriately trained. And that is, by the way, in the EU directive and all our US laws. So, um, and, and my organization actually, we give it an award for um, uh, innovative training issues. So that's something you want to look out for. Um, the researcher is, the PI is the one who run the, runs the labs, but the people who actually care for the animals are essential. They have to be trained well, they have to be compensated well, they have to be treated well. So the laboratory has to be run as a business with humane care as its central theme, which I, I appreciate your pointing out. And I agree with your um, uh, adding the four R, four R's, uh, fourth R of respect too. Thank you. If I, if I may, uh, also, I think, I mean, it's just a little bit perhaps outside the scope of this, of this panel, but I think one of the issues that um, one encounters in this discipline is the foundational question of what is and isn't necessary. And, when, you know, there's an, there's an ethical question at the root of that, which, you know, there are people of good faith on both sides of it. Is animal testing necessary in the sense of should you do it? Should you do it? Regardless of what one might perceive to be the gains, is it okay to do it anyway if it causes a lot of, and, and here I have to respectfully differ with Paul, suffering uh, to, to animals who eventually end up dying? And the, you know, again, those of you who heard me uh, yesterday uh, you know I'm all about rhetoric, right? So the, the idea of sacrifice, for example, which is a common term in the industry, sacrifice, the, the word connotes volu a, a agency and voluntarism. So if one sacrifices, one is doing something for somebody else. If the animal doesn't choose it, it is not a sacrifice, just linguistically speaking. And the, these, are, these are things that I think as we engage in what I think is a very useful discussion about you know, where, what are the ethical boundaries here, I think we have to be very careful with, with our terminology. Good morning, my name is Peggy Kniff and I'm the executive director of the National Anti-Vivisection Society. So I've been working on this issue probably longer than some of you have been alive. I want to say, first of all, comment on your use of semantics. I think that's critically important for us advocates to not charge scientists with torture and cruelty if we want to engage in dialogue. Our organization wants to work with scientists, with the legal community, and bring them together to resolve some of these situations. The other term is research animals. Animals were not born to be research animals. A dog in a lab is no different than your companion animals at home. So we want to stop getting away from the term research animals. Animals used in research is probably a better terminology. Um, I first became exposed to the use of animals in toxicity testing in New York City. Uh, a man named Henry Spira was leading a protest against Revlon co Cosmetics. How many bunnies does Revlon blind for beauty's sake? That was way back in the mid-70s. I'm told now by our science advisors that there are no companies in the United States who are still testing cosmetics or their ingredients on animals. You've got companies now developing products that are closer to pharmaceuticals. They still need, they think, 
animal data, but we're getting, it, uh, getting away from it, and it's not well regulated. But the alternatives that are available today for toxicity testing are phenomenal. And these are being used now over in China. The Institute for In Vitro Sciences, for example, is just one of the groups of scientists going over to educate their scientists on these alternatives and how they can be used. And the feedback we're getting is that the young Chinese scientists are totally convinced that this is the way to go. Um, the last thing I just wanted to point out, and I hate to just make these as comments, when we talk about the three R's of replacement, reduction, and refinement, that was a great move forward for animal welfare. But it was based on a presumption that research or testing on animals works, and therefore it's not only uh, needed, it's necessary. And we're finding more and more that it doesn't work. Uh, 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 Collins, uh, Francis Collins at NIH has said we need to find new toxicity methods. The old ones do not work for predicting what is safe or effective in humans. Uh, the past pre head of NIH has said the same thing. We drank the Kool-Aid, we himself included. We thought animal models were the way to go. Bottom line, it doesn't work. So not only is it not necessary, it's not needed, it's wasting resources. So my question is how can lawyers and scientists work with the advocates who really care about this issue to move this forward, especially within the regulatory agencies. Yeah. Since you mentioned Henry Spira and the Revlon um, <coughs> protest, I wanted to go back because I actually have that picture here so people can see it because it was a very powerful advertisement and very powerful, very striking. Yeah. I don't think that's from the 60s, maybe the 70s or 80s. Yeah. So did you also want to respond to her question about? Yeah, so I think, first of all, um, obviously David and I do not agree at all on the issue of um, animals in research. And I will tell you that, again, if an animal is being treated cruelly, if an animal is in pain or in suffering, then the Iacuc missed the mark. That's not the way animal research is can be conducted. It's not ethical, and it's not appropriate scientifically. It is true that animals give their lives in research very often, because at the end of the experiment, many animals, especially rodents, are euthanized. And that is an important ethical question that we need to discuss. Um, in terms of your point, I think you're asking really getting to the ultimate question, which is, can we eliminate the use of animals in research? And how do we do that? So I think I'll give a legal answer and a scientific answer. It depends. <laughs> and um, I think, first of all, we have to for point out that we have had certain successes in cosmetics in, in the EU member states. That is a big win. And in the cosmetics world, I think you're going to see more and more that products, consumers will not stand for products that have been tested on animals or where their components have been tested on animals worldwide. So I think in terms of cosmetics, we're moving in the right direction. In terms of toxicity testing for chemicals and safety testing for chemicals, I think in two decades, we could be out of the animal testing business. We could have a system where we use virtually no animals. And that is not just me um, waving a flag. The National Academy of Sciences said that in their 2007 report on toxicity testing in the 21st century. Now, in order to do that, we need to have a strong voice among lawyers that really talks to our legislators and our funders about investing in developing science that doesn't use animals. If we don't have a scientific engine that can develop alternatives, we're going to be locked in the status quo. And this is something that I've been working on fairly aggressively on Capitol Hill uh, in Washington uh, when they're not arguing about the budget and things like that. Um, but a very exciting development is that the new um, legislation coming forward on the reauthorization of TSCA, the Toxic Substance Control Act, actually has provisions in it about the three R's. So that's for toxicity testing. For academic and medical research, I think the picture is a lot more cloudy. And I'm not sure that we'll be able to um, predict when or if we can eliminate animal research. And there are many reasons for that. Um, some relate to the science itself. Some relate to the inertia of the system. That's going to be a harder slog. So I try and answer the question. Uh, I think you know, Paul. Paul's right. We don't. We don't. He and I don't agree at all. But but I think <laughs> I, I think 
I think it's important also to note that, that Paul and I do have a similar goal in the sense that 20 years from now, I would be delighted if we eliminated all, all, all testing of animals. I'd like it to be tomorrow because what, 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 hap- what, what we get at, and, and, this is, and this is sort of a roundabout way of getting at your question, is a cru- cruelty laws talk about how you are barred from unjustifiable acts of cruelty. Now this is an interesting legalism because unjustifiable to who? If it's unjustifiable to the animal, then all vivisection should be eliminated tomorrow. There is, there is no reason whatsoever for the animal, and again, Paul and I are going to differ on this, uh, is, in, there's no benefit to the animal to experimenting on that animal. Perhaps you could make an argument, you could make an argument, that it might be good for the species going forward, but if we're treating animals as individuals, it is never good to cause them suffering. And unless it is for their immediate gain, as in you're treating, you're treating an illness or an injury. So in that sense, when we're talking about how we can go forward and work legally, there, there is a foundational issue at the root of our cruelty laws. When we talk about justifiable, we, well, the same reason that the food industry can justify a lot of its actions and, and say they're not cruel in the sense, well, it's economically beneficial to the producer. So we have to interrogate the, what our laws are enacted for. And similarly, when we talk about why the Animal Welfare Act excludes mice, mice and rats, it's because after a victory by the Animal Legal Defense Fund uh, in court about, <laughs> about this, no, no, I'm sorry, it wasn't the Animal Legal, it was the Alternative Research, I can't remember, it's AR, ARDF. Um, it was a, a court victory which required the Secretary of Agriculture to actually include mice and rats within the ambit of the uh, Animal Welfare Act. Congress amended the Animal Welfare Act to exclude mice and rats because the, you know, the, the research industry lobbied hard for it. So I think part of what we're engaged in here is, a, is, is not just a legal battle, because you can, you, I mean, let's face it, we're all lawyers here, and <laughs> we lose these battles all the time. We do, because there is no, there is no real national will to address them. And so what, what, one, what one gets at here is, you know, should, should, and again, I'm just sort of circling back to your question, you know, Paul talked about how he's not hopeful about eliminating animals in medical research. And so the question has to be, you know, how does one legislate towards an acknowledgement that using animals, for example, is it cruel, is it cruel to the animal to give that, to, to breed an animal to contract a kind of cancer that is exquisitely painful and will limit her or his life. That to me is cruel. I can't, you know, I can't go any farther than that because it's not justifiable to me to, for the animal. And, when, and, and when, we, when we begin interrogating those types of terms in a broader context as well as a narrow context, that to me is when progress will be made. And I know that we, uh... Gosh, we only have just three minutes left. And did you want to? Was there a? Well, I think um, first I should um, invite Dave to be a guest lecturer in our class. Absolutely. You know, get him out to Portland. I do want to say though that this is an important issue, and um, one of the things I want to—you don't have to agree with me. You don't have to agree with David. My guess is you guys are going to um, agree more with David. And you know what? That's fine. I what I want is I want to enlist you in the effort to develop more alternatives to animals. And if you're enlisted in that effort because you are focused on the animals, that's fine. I'm enlisted in that effort because I'm focused on the animals, but I'm also focused on the science. And we can work together on these things, and we can have successes. So maybe um, in my lifetime, we won't eliminate all animals in biomedical research. Maybe we'll ask hard questions about that. Maybe we'll make a better system. But maybe in your lifetime, we will. And if we ask the question, and we all have the goal of eventually eliminating or minimizing animals in research, and it's a matter of how long that takes, I think that's really worth discussing. And I think we should work together on those things. And I, yeah. and David, we have one minute left. Any last thoughts that you would like to share? Oh, <laughs> OK. OK, and a question. <laughs> My name's. Um, Hello. We have one minute. Okay. Uh, my name is Lynn Brennan. I've been a, a biotech patent litigator for 
uh, more than 10 years. And so I've seen as in a very practical way that uh, researchers, look, the FDA requires these tests so they can't get around it, um, at least right now in the present system. Um, and so, you know, I had to, as part of discovery, go through research notebooks and see some of these experiments that have been done on animals. It was very hard to do, but again, that was part of uh, part of the litigation had to be done. What, if any, uh, a dialogue with the FDA, I've heard the NIH, which is great, and it sounds like the NIH is going in a great direction, but the FDA is the one that promulgates all these regulations that are required for preclinical testing, and so every company, every for-profit company has to abide by those regulations, has to do testing on animals. So what is being done uh, to work with the FDA to try to move away from animal testing, if any? That's a really excellent question. We, I don't have the time to explore it entirely. I, I will point out that um, the FDA is, is particularly a point where we as lawyers should be asking some hard questions about the regs and whether the scientific validity of the regulations is still appropriate. Or are we using 1940 sciences in, in the 2000 and, and you know, uh, next century? Um, I will also say that um, I think um, one thing I've learned at this meeting is that uh, we have to have a lot of conversations with the FDA because they're also the ones that um, regulate the subtherapeutic use of drugs in animal agriculture. So I'll um, go back to Washington and I'll have a conversation with them. And I would um, actually suggest to a lot of you that that may be a very fruitful place to spend your time. And any last thoughts, David? Uh, I would just I would just conclude by by repeating something I said earlier, which is that this, like virtually every area of a, within the animal legal world, is an area where people of good faith can disagree, and one has to, I think, in order to make progress in this in this field as well as any, is acknowledge that and keep that in the forefront of one's consciousness. I I can I can admire and respect Paul and his point of view without agreeing with it at all, and I think we need to remember that we. We, we all need to work that way going forward. Thank you so much, and thank you for your time.